My name is Sheen Towers. I am currently the Director of Studies for the Metropolitan College Number no. 1 of the SRIA. And um, I have great pleasure today in introducing our presenter, who is free, uh, sorry, excuse me, who is Frater Peter Lewis Haywood. Now, the title of uh, Frater Peter's presentation today has really, really sparked my interest um, because of its title. And the title is this, The Harmonic Structure of Universes and Our Realities. Um, I'd just like to preface this by, by uh, saying there's a, a particular um, very old nugget of Taoist wisdom that is the first passage of the Tao Te Ching. And uh, it says, the Tao that can be named is not the true Tao. This is one of my favorite, favorite little quotes of wisdom from anywhere. Because what we think we know, as soon as we think we know it, that's not it. Because the, the magnitude of the mystery of creation is far beyond our comprehension. We like to think we know what's what. But what I'm interested in is exploring beyond those um, current assumptions and human self-imposed restrictions and limitations on how we perceive reality. So having said this, uh, I have great pleasure in introducing Frater Peter Lewis Hayward. Over to you, Frater Peter. Thank you, Frater Sheen. I'll just start sharing my screen and I would like to also test the audio sharing if I may. That's working. Uh, right, I just got to find the bit that says audio. Um, hmm. I had it the other day. Uh, here we go, share computer sound. So. Hopefully all is well. Uh, Yep, that's all looking good. Right, we'll soon find out about the audio then. Uh, right, I'll just get rid of that. Um, not quite sure how to get rid of that, but there we go. Um, right, um, yes, the, the title for today's talk is The Harmonic Structure of Universes and Our Realities. Um, I admit I was... Um, <laughs> deliberately uh, cho chose that title to entice a little bit of interest since I'm an unknown quantity at the moment. Um, but anyways, it's uh, going, essentially going to be an introduction to the science of harmonics and how geometry underpins the nature of reality. Then subject to time, either within the presentation itself uh, or within the discussion, um, I, I've put some leads in the presentation that, that really invite us to start thinking about the, the nature of perception and our consciousness and our connection to it uh, and how one might affect the other, uh, generally using uh, senses usually considered beyond our own um, typically known senses. So moving on. Uh, so welcome for our trust and friends. And I would like to say thank you to our hosts today, SRI London and the Metropolitan Study Group. And if I can kick off and uh, perhaps set the tone or the, <laughs> It gives some context and uh, explain what I am talking about when I talk about harmonic. Um, I'm not a musician, 
uh, nor a mathematician for that matter. And uh, I know if there are any uh, trained musicians out there, um, so, so my, my interpretations or my use might be not strictly in line with music theory and things like that, but I don't think I'm far, uh, too far off it. Um, now, what, what I mean is um, I'm talking about any static or dynamic quantitative relationships, whether they be numerical or by measure of ratio, between two or more things we're compared with respect to each other, usually in whole number or very close to whole number ratios. And examples of that will be geometrical relationships in space, usually symbol of shapes like circles, triangles, lines, um, or, or indeed anything that's uh, of a similar shape, but maybe of a different scale. And then secondly, uh, dynamic relationships formed in moving systems, which will be in our time and space as we understand it. Um, and that uh, examples, that would be music in chords, either played chords played simultaneously or in melody in sequence and extending even to things like physical matter, like the atoms of the elements in the periodic table. That's the quantitative side. Uh, I also want to start bringing in um, an and or with that and bring in perceived qualitative relationships uh, by comparison, well, by comparison, always by comparison between two or more things. An example of that is um, when things perceived to have some correspondence. And an example of that would be two or more experiences, uh, maybe grouped together by shared attributes, uh, for example, color um, or, or qualities, uh, even, even things like emotions evoked uh, by music and sensations. And then just to cap it off, fundamentally harmonics create form order structure and hierarchy. And I hope I managed to get that uh, message over during the presentation. A little bit of Masonic symbolism here. Um, I found it interesting over the years as I was getting into this subject matter that within Freemasonry's own definition of itself, the symbolism alludes to harmony. In this case, I found this very beautiful um, wording, slightly different to um, our standing one, uh, no doubt an old one, but very beautiful indeed. And what I, my, the way I think about it is morality, um, as with all symbolism, um, has lots of different meanings and layers of meanings and I came across understanding it that it, it is a veil for the word differentiation uh, to separate to divide to distinguish so uh, when we divide one thing into two or more parts we can then make comparisons um, without any perceived differences we wouldn't we don't we wouldn't see anything um, uh, but we can make comparisons between the parts and the whole. And then secondly, the, 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 the term system of morality itself alludes to order and relationships. Um, to have a system sort of implies that there are processes, structure and sequences involved and from which research to and strive for harmony that we may work together in harmony according to the design of the system as a whole. Uh, and a few little basic geometrical shapes. And I'll move on from there. Uh, let's spend a little, a couple of minutes or so on this. Um, uh, Logos, a word of God or word, to Trinity as something that has 
um, captivated me for over, well over 20 years, understanding how we go from nothing to one, and then two, and then three. And it's really only in recent years, and with the aid of this study, and Masonic and SRI symbolism, hermetic principles, that I've actually more confident that I have a sense of what it's about. Now, I found this beautifully written piece of text on academia. The link will be down there. Um, but essentially, we're, we're talking about uh, the, mo the monad, the, the dyad, and then on to the third principi princ uh, principle, um, harmony, uh, trinity, um, uh, trinity, um, the third principle of harmony. Um, if somebody's unfamiliar with this, um, please do come back and read this in detail and, and, and enjoy it for what it is. It's, it's beautifully written, but essentially it's, it, it's well, we have one, number one is, it, <laughs> it's the biggest number in the cosmos, or, biggest number, um, but it's viewed as a principle. So in, in a sense, it's not necessarily a quantitative number as such. It, it, it has a qualitative um, a quality about it, um, but we can uh, also uh, assign it um, a, a number at the same time. And um, so we start off with the mode on it, which is undifferentiated in, in, in the beginning. And then going on from that, things emanate from nothing. And so we go from the monad to the, the next principle, the dyad, um, which represents diversity, opposing powers, which is very important, um, duality, and so on. And then on to the, the beginning of the third principle, harmony. Um, now, this triad is, or was, is imminent in nature and represented a dynamic process of cosmology. One was the unification, two represent the diversi diversification and differentiation of the one and this is really key, it's the differentiation of the one um, and, and then the process of forming the world order or ordered world, cosmos and harmony or logos was the bond uniting these two extremes. Uh, there's a nice bit of text here, but I, I, I won't read through that. Right, um, geometry. Some examples of geometry here, a little bit of modern geometry on, on the left. Um, this came from Manly P. Hall's archives. Um, where that came from in the first place, I don't know, but it's a, it, it, it's a fundamental part of what we're talking about today, this particular bit here. Um, again, we've got the basic shapes, of square or strictly right angle, but I couldn't draw a right, right angle here, so I drew the square circle and, and, and triangle. These, some people may already have seen or come across. And this big one here, uh, Flower of Life, um, which um, some people will be familiar with, um, if not, um, uh, and those that are at the moment I'll introduce it a little bit later on. So geometry that we may be familiar with. Um, younger master masons may possibly not know this particular three, four, five ratio, um, which is uh, part of our fixed furniture. And this business here, um, uh, as you can see, I, I, I actually took this, um, this is a logo, blew it up and did some drawings over it. And I, uh, and because they're very fuzzy and that 
they weren't 100 percent precise but as far as I, I can make out this particular geometry is um for three by four by five triangles that meet in the middle and then of particular note we we actually find inside it a pentagram which um uh, is essentially um, it encodes um, a very important ratio, the phi or the sometimes called phi ratio uh, or go, go, golden ratio of 1.618 and uh, zero, you know, zero point six one eight and so on and so forth. So some very fundamental geometry and proportions that. Um, I think are important for people to sort of have a starting point with. And then something which I'm not sure many people would have seen this particular one, but this is, this is um, circle geometry. And um, I was very fortunate in the last couple of years or so that I came across a really, really clever mathematician. His name's John Gabriel. And um, he's a little bit of a maverick, uh, very, very outspoken. But what, what's here is if you have a circle here and you divide it up with this right angle here, you can vary these ratios any way you like, and they will always come out with very pr precise uh, proportions uh, ratios, which you can't necessarily achieve in algebra. Um, all arithmetic and all geometry uh, is is really contained within the circle. And I think I don't I don't know. It, it, it was new to me uh, until a re recent years. And to give an example of what you can do with that is you can take this, this circle here and, or I forgot to say, it doesn't matter which one, you can choose any one of these four legs and anywhere in the circle, and you can choose whichever one you want to be the unit. So in this case, the uh, I've chosen this one here as the unit of one. I've actually just put pi squared in there, uh, presuming you know what, the, the value of pi is in the first place. And, um, and, and what you find in this particular configuration when that side and that side are equal, and that is one to pi squared, this leg here oh, and, and that leg there are the square root of whatever this, this is. So in this case, if that's pi squared, that's pi. And you can actually use this geometry to square the circle. Um, I don't think we'll have time for that today, but anyway, really important. And I, I, I hope that's new for some people. Now I'm going to play a video, uh, introduce sacred geometry, which most the consensus seems to be that geometry of consciousness and remembering. Um, and it's all done with circles and a simple sequence of creation and then ultimately cubes and spheres. Um, there's one book that I would like to show you, but I won't for now, but it's called Quadrivium. It's an absolute gem. And if anybody is new to sacred geometry, I would say that's the first book you get your hands on, either a digital copy or a hard copy. Um, and then we're gonna cover Today, the basics of a shape called the Vesica Pisces, flower of life. Try to get the Taurus field and maybe the Merkaba, but the Vesica Pisces and a flower of life. And down here are some very high quality resources on the subject of um, sacred geometry, including Brother Randall Carson, who's quite. Um, uh, quite well known in, in, in that field. Uh, another gentleman, this gentleman here, uh, Jane 108, and an absolute gem, uh, the gentleman called the Bard, 
and they're, they're all links here. But if I may, I'd like to play this video. It's an animated voice or we'll speed it up, but here we go. Um, the, the, the content is, is, is superb. If you swim, you're a swimmer. If you run, you're a runner. But if you flow, then you are a flower. Everything in the universe is geometric, whether it's people, trees, cats, planets, solar systems, you name it. Literally everything in the universe can be measured on a geometric scale. In this same way, we can actually identify that creation is also geometric. And what we're gonna look at today is the pattern of creation and see if we can't glimpse the source of all things. Essentially, everything in reality is said to come out of this single pattern. I'm not making this up. This single image will change everything. It's called the flower of life, and it's said to be the creation pattern of everything in existence, even non-tangible things like emotions and thoughts, because this pattern begins with the subtlest vibrations of consciousness far beyond anything our current technology can measure and extends through every possible frequency and into the physical material creation. It is said that there are 13 information systems that comes out of the flower of life likely relative to the secret ancient Egyptian 13 chakra system, no doubt. Today, we're going to look at how the physical reality manifests, which is one of the 13 systems. It's also important to note that at first, this might not make sense. I ask that you watch with an open mind and try and see if this resonates with you. As always, have your own experience, take what resonates and leave the rest behind. One more thing, by learning about sacred geometry simply by observing, you're absorbing only a very small amount of information. If you wanna learn more, I recommend you draw it yourself. When you do this, you begin to see things in a new way. You begin to create new mental patterns and connect with your own higher understanding, promise. The flower of life has been known around the world throughout history. It was found in Ireland, Turkey, Israel, Egypt, China, Greece, Germany, India, and Iceland. It's also been recorded to be found in England, Tibet, Japan, Sweden, Lapland, the Yucatan, and about 14 other places. This thing is everywhere. Surely a pattern of such global significance must mean something, right? This pattern is called a flower, not just because it looks like a flower, but because it represents the cycle of a fruit tree. A fruit tree makes a little flower, which then goes through a metamorphosis and becomes a fruit. Within that fruit contains a seed, which falls to the ground and grows into another tree. The cyclical nature of reality is seen as the flower, fruit, seed, and tree, which is a pattern created within and through this very geometry. We can relate this with many ancient wisdom teachings that already exist in more prominence on this planet. For example, we can see it in Christianity and the Hermetic teachings, which spoke on the word of God. The flower of life is known as the source of all language, the primordial root of all vibration, which stems from pure beingness. We can also see a connection here to the Tao, the word of which translates to the way. In one of the shortest verses in the Tao Te Ching, it says, the Tao moves through returning. The Tao is used through yielding. All things are born of being. Being is born of non-being. Are you picking up what I'm throwing down? The flower of life is a cyclical pattern, part of a greater whole, the wisdom of which is reflected in many traditions the world over. In this, we might find an intrinsic unity and use the flower of life to recognize that all belief systems are connected if we are only willing to look and see how. Now, to understand the flower of life, we must discuss how it's formed. Imagine consciousness or spirit floating in the void, which means it's nothingness and then consciousness, pure awareness. We cannot possibly put an actual drawing on it because it's formless and beyond any image. But let's use this eye of Ra for now. In this void space, you can't do anything. You're not falling, because where would you fall to? There's just nothing. From here, this formless, indescribable perfection decides to do something. So it projects a beam of its awareness in one direction, which naturally leads to the creation of six spatial directions. Awareness to the front is mirrored to the back, naturally then left and right, and then up and down also come about. 
and doing this creates an octahedron of its own awareness, where relative movement is now possible in relationship to this shape. This is significant because the octahedron is considered relative to the mind, and the Hermeticists would often describe that all is a creation within the mind of God. So it would make sense that this shape would be instrumental in forming even the first sphere. And that is actually the next step, to spin the octahedron with such intensity that it becomes a perfect sphere. Remember, sacred geometry started when spirit made its first projection into the void. The void is nothingness, and these forms created are also nothing. They're just imaginary lines made out of consciousness, which gives you an indication of what reality might actually be, nothing. In Hinduism, one word for the reality field is called Maya, which means illusion. Now that the first sphere is created, spirit has an awareness of what's around itself in 360 degrees. It moves to the very edge of the sphere anywhere and repeats what it did the first time. It creates this image, which contains the Vesica Pisces. This is a particular geometry that is very well represented in the world as the image of the Jesus fish, reflecting the wisdom of the word of God from the very geometries of creation. Mathematically speaking, within the Vesica Pisces is a vast amount of knowledge about width, proportion, and depth. Herein, we also have the square roots of two, three, and five, which are all infinite numbers. And we also have geometric information about light. None of this would have existed with only one sphere. So now you can probably start to see the significance of this creation pattern. From here, spirit continues the creation process, moving flawlessly to create the next circle exactly one radius away from the other circle next to it. With every new sphere that comes into being, more and more mathematical knowledge emerges. The first complete image to be formed is this, which has two names, the seed of life or the Genesis pattern, and for good reason. Let's actually look at the book of Genesis for a moment. With each creation of each sphere, it could be seen as a day. After the first movement, when the second sphere was created, we had information about light come into being. The opening of Genesis 1 says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. The key here is in the order. The movement happened first, then light happened immediately after, just as we saw with the formation of the seed of life. And we're not even done. Within this Genesis pattern, after the third sphere is created, you now have the pattern known around the world as the Holy Trinity, depicted in literally countless churches. It's also written in the Bible that on the fourth day of Genesis, exactly one half of creation was completed. Starting from the first motion, exactly one half of the circles were formed on the fourth day. Now, when we get to the sixth day, a geometric miracle takes place. The last circle forms a complete six petaled flower. The Bible even says that creation was formed in six days and this fits exactly. You see, this is the pattern of Genesis, and thus we may call it the Genesis pattern, which is also the beginning of the creation of reality as we know it. Now, as we discussed briefly, the pattern of the flower of life is a living one, not static. And so as you continue to develop it, the seed of life develops a tree of life, which produces a flower of life and the fruit of life emerges therein. The tree of life is a very interesting concept known around the world by countless traditions, depicted sometimes as a tree, sometimes as a geometric structure, and sometimes as a collection of dimensions or worlds in which our physical reality is one of them, the tree of life is outside of any race or religion and may be considered one of the oldest belief systems on the planet, describing how all of life and creation are interconnected as branches or roots of a great tree. And on that Thank subject, you. I'll do a bigger video about this at some point, but for now, let's move on. Along with the flower, fruit, seed, and tree cycle, the flower of life also yields a fifth image, which is called the egg of life. This is a very significant form that is relative to your physical body. We discuss it in our spirit science video called Power of the Heart, where you can see how your very existence began with the egg of life when you were just a clump of cells in the Anunnaki test tube. I, I mean, um, your mother's belly. Check out our video called Power of the Heart to learn more. But for now, before we run out of time, I wanna show you something really cool. Now, all around the world, the flower of life was most often depicted as being completed after 19 circles. Why that number specifically? Well, in biology, we have this protective layer that surrounds most eggs called the zona pellucida. 
which is like a protective boundary layer that functions for a time. And these bigger circles around the flower of life are like the zona pellucida of the flower of life. If we remove these and add the final missing circles, you get this, the fruit of life. It is said that this pattern of 13 circles is one of the holiest, most sacred forms in existence. It's called the fruit because it is the result, the fruit from which the details of the fabric of reality were created. Remember in our previous video about masculine and feminine energy and how we discussed masculine energy moves in straight lines and feminine energy moves in curves? Well, this image so far is all curves, baby. But when you combine straight lines with these curves, you get a very complex image known as Metatron's cube. Metatron's cube is significant because it bears within it all five platonic solids, which are legendary shapes discovered by the Greek philosopher Plato several thousand years ago. The five platonic solids all have very specific characteristics by definition. First, all of its faces are the same size. Second, the edges are all about the same length. And third, it only has one interior angle between each face. What's more, when put inside of a sphere, all of the points will touch the edge of the sphere perfectly. With that definition, there are only five shapes that fit that description. These are the dodecahedron, the tetrahedron, the octahedron, the icosahedron, and the hexahedron. These five shapes were considered by the ancient alchemists to have an elemental aspect to them as well. The tetrahedron was considered fire, the cube was earth, the octahedron was air, the icosahedron was water, and the dodecahedron was ether. The sphere itself was voidness. This understanding of the elements are different than the periodic table we know today, but relate instead with the archetypal forces that reality was foundationally built upon. With that said, it is known today that the periodic table of elements is also relative to these shapes. In the 1980s, Professor Robert Moon at the University of Chicago demonstrated that the entire periodic table of elements can be related back to these essential geometries. You can read an article about it in the description if you're super keen to go deeper. You see, throughout modern physics today, along with chemistry and biology, the sacred geometric patterns of creation are being rediscovered. Another example is the egg of life that I showed you earlier, literally showing up in your intrinsic cellular structure from conception. Hopefully, this will help you to understand and witness the beautiful unity amongst all things. It doesn't matter what you believe, what religion you follow, or if you're strictly an atheist scientist, bearing witness to the truth of this pattern of creation yields understanding that all things are connected by something greater than any of us can truly comprehend. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I, I think that's one of the finest sacred geometry videos that I've ever come across over the years. And I'm happy I could share that with you. I'll move on now. Um, if you want to do a little bit of geometry yourself, I've included a link. There's this absolutely wonderful application called, I think it's Desmos. And um, I've here, I've just created a couple of uh, circles forming a Vesica Pisces, uh, as previously described. And you can just use this link. And if you want, you can go and um, make some of your own flower of lives. And, and if you just carry this on yourself, It, um, it, it, it does actually rearrange your, your, your thinking over time and you do see patterns. And this is, this particular application is only been, in, well, started a few year, a few weeks ago, it's in, still in beta. Um, I actually regularly write in with suggestions <laughs> to improve it, but they're doing a wonderful job. And I highly recommend this application if you wanted to try some uh, um, geometry for yourself um, uh, in, 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 with a digital square and compass effectively. So that links there. Right, moving on to the subject of octaves and now we're getting into sound and music. Um, I'll explain what, um, or just 
play a quick little series of octaves here, but the octave itself is um, uh, using the ratios two to one or one to two. Um, that's the structure of the uh, musical octave and the first overtone or undertone in a very important um, subject called the harmonic series, which is born naturally by physical law. So it's very consistent. So I'll, I'll just quickly show you what I mean by an octave. We start in here, choosing a frequency of 220 Hertz, and then just doubling all the way up. So that's two to one ratio as we got the scale. And then coming down, we're then starting here, we're, we're, we're just halving or all, all, all the way down. Start, yeah, I checked with six of them all okay. So when I speak of octaves, we're talking about doubling and halving effectively. Now, Moving on to the harmonic series, it's, it is the foundation of all musical scales and tuning systems because it is the only natural scale. Um, it's not something artificial where we've created our own say, uh, modern music scales of equal temperament or we use electronic ones and so on and so forth. These, these obey natural law, natural physics, natural physical law. And um, effectively, as soon as the tone sounds, um, overtones resonate and they all sound at the same time. So in, in effect, the harmonic series, which is multiple uh, overtones or undertones, they, they, they effectively, in music terms, uh, form, form a chord. And the, the interesting thing is the structure is always the same and it corresponds to a mathematical harmonic series. And I'll show you a little bit to explain that a little bit further. Um, yes, I'll not speak. There's some good videos um, that do that. Um, getting a, probably a little bit more sort of technical here. Um, and, and I only figured this out in the last couple of years was um, the, the, the relationship between sine waves and the harmonic series. Now, I've got this little uh, title here, it takes two to tango. And the, the reason for that is all things in the physical universe are in constant circular sinusoidal motion and they form spirals and the universe is composed of an infinity of potential sine waves but by themselves sine waves do not generate harmonics in nature uh, and, and there's a reason for that because it, it actually takes two sources of sound sine waves or indeed light waves it's the same principle sound and light follow the same uh, laws just at different um, scales and frequencies, um, but it takes two sources to interact to be able to generate these overtones, subharmonics, i.e. the harmonic series. And just so um, people know that this is a, a, um, a representation, a graphical plot of sine wave, which basically plots the circular functions. So fairly, um, but by themselves, if you've just got one, one sine wave in the whole cosmos, happily singing its little song, um, it won't do anything. It'll just keep on doing that. It actually requires two. And now I'm going to introduce um, the subject of 
standing waves in relationships to the harmonic series and essentially two or more sine waves interacting form standing waves and this is really really important this this bit here um, if you're a mathematician or a physicist or scientist and that perhaps this is um, fairly straightforward but uh, anyways now this happens when sound of light is contained we get standing waves when the, the they're contained and reflected by some form of boundary. Uh, usually that would be in a box, for example, or most commonly in music, a tensioned wire clamped at both ends. For example, piano, violin, violin string, or guitar string. And here's a, a, a little graphic I've drawn to, to show that. This is our wire. Um, the ends of the boundaries, that's how it's contained. And um, what happens here is we will we'll, we'll get going in one direction. Um, there will be a vibration go that way, and then it gets reflected and back, and it reflects back, and they interact. And it's that interaction that generates this all-important harmonic series probably worth saying that the, the they form standing wave patterns um but it's not just a simple addition um of, of two waves well what actually happens is um they create a synthesis of the of the two waves um a second and a third and and the important thing here is an infinite number of partials or harmonics um uh are, are created and this happens in nature and this is how the harmonic series is generated in the first place and uh, i must uh, i have to say that it's only the last couple of years that i actually figured that out um Right, so some little graphics of the harmonic series um, coming down to the bottom here. Uh, this is our string that could be a piano uh, string. It could be the, uh, the note C, for example. And then what happens is when that is struck, in addition to the, the note or the frequency of whatever that fundamental is, um, we also get the physical laws mean that we also get additional harmonics as a result of the, the, the first one is it in fact an octave, um, uh, it's vibrating at the middle of the string and um, the, the, the way that string lengths and frequency works, that means that there's a higher frequency generated, an octave higher on, on a two to one ratio. But in, as you can see, we're actually subdividing the string. Now, I won't go into this, but you will notice that these are all whole number ratios. And it doesn't just stop here, it just goes on and on forever. And the interesting thing is, well, what, what, you know, why, 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 why don't they just carry on and, and, and everything blows up? And there's a really good reason for that. Um, here's a nice picture representation of the harmonic series in comparison to a, uh, a shell, um, which I find quite interesting. Um, I guess that's a conch shell. Um, right, that's, that's a visual. Now, I've got, this is a very good video, but I'll leave that towards the end and see how time goes. Uh, I'll come back to it, but in principle, this is what's happening. When you strike one uh, tensioned wire, it, I mean, it, it could be a, a wind instrument, the same, as long as it's contained and there are boundaries involved, we'll get these reflections and we'll get uh, two sources of waves that interact and 
as a result, we will get a whole series of these. The important question is, why don't they blow up? Um, in order to understand that, I first need to explain a couple of things about the nature of both sound and light waves and the, the distinction between the two main wave types, which are transverse and longitudinal waves. Um, transverse uh, waves, they're cyclical, like light electromagnetic waves, everything's light really, um, but also it applies to vibrating strings, which when they vibrate and via the harmonic series, um, we, we create sound and both sound and light um, exhibit what they call longitudinal scalar waves. Um, effectively, they're akin to pressure waves, certainly with, with sound. So with a vibrating string, this is what happens. You get a, a transverse wave and a very good video here, which I will briefly show a little bit of it. And that's what moves the air. And then the air is the sound wave. And that is when we have an example of a longitudinal wave, um, which is vibrating the particles of the medium, in, a, in our case, typically air. Um, and a good example of uh, sound waves in a longitudinal direction is the tuning fork. Um, this is effectively represented here by different pressure levels. Now, the interesting things about the differences between transverse waves and longitudinal waves is transverse waves are, in mathematical terms, are vectors, which means they have a magnitude value, but they also have a, a de direction. Um, and in electromagnetic light terms, there would be an electric field and a magnetic field, and they're at right angles to each other. Um, whereas in longitudinal waves, it's along the direction of the, uh, shall we say, movement, um, or the, uh, between the two sources, and there's no real direction here. And this is why we call them scalar waves. Uh, this term scalar waves is that they have magnitudes. They have a magnitude of pressure, but there's no particular direction, even though this graphic here sort of shows, show, show, shows direction. Um, that, that's not quite so. And um, years ago um, in physics, Maxwell's equations contained um, terms to account for these longitudinal scalar waves and they got somewhere along the line they got zeroed out because well they just got zeroed out and it's held physics back for a long time. I'll just show a quick portion of this video just to show what a vibrating string transverse wave. Imagine the spinning motion starting somewhere in front of your head, coming near your body and descending towards the abdomen, then going away from you, ascending as it gets further away, and finally coming back closer to your head as it reaches the highest point, repeating the entire motion. If this was a blue snake, it would advance from left to right. This can be noticed by paying attention at the head here. This creates the illusion of doing the opposite, that is, the impression of traveling in the other direction. For the red component,
Imagine the red circle. The red circle's rotating motion starting somewhere in front of your head. Coming near your body and descending towards the abdomen, then going away from you, ascending as it gets further away, and finally coming back closer to your head as it reaches the highest point, repeating the entire motion. The red snake spins in exact same direction as the blue snake, around the green axis. The difference is, the red snake advances from right to left, also creating the illusion of doing the opposite. No matter how you look at it, the two components travel in opposite directions while spinning in the same direction around the green axis. The blue and red I'll stop it there and just, um, the, there's, this is actually how light works as well. This gentleman's talking about a vibrating string on a, on a violin, but the, this is true. Light uh, transverse uh, electromagnetic waves uh, for, for light. This gentleman really knows his stuff. Um, very, very impressed with this. Um, but the, the, the analogy I want to make here is with DNA, the helical nature, these two things, they, they dance around, they're, they're always going in the same direction um, and they just dance around the middle and they, they're, they're sort of connected, two of them together. And um, this gentleman, what he's trying to say is that we don't understand the nature of transverse waves very well. And I think he's quite true. Um, right, I'll, I'll, I'll um, save, save you going through that. Red snakes do not... Uh, God, yeah. Not spin in opposite. I need to come back to that. So anyway, that's um, uh, key differences between the two main wave types. Very important. Um, I don't think many people really understand these transverse waves particularly well, even today. And as for longitudinal scalar waves, whilst they're understood with regards to sound pressure, um, they're not very well understood. Um, this, this is what Nikola Tesla and those working in, in, in that field, um, he, he was actually using longitudinal waves. Um, so it's, it's worth knowing about them. Um, the, big, the big question is wh why standing waves form and stabilize uh, when you have the harmonic series creating all these overtones or these, these harmonics, you would think, well, the, uh, like the feedback when somebody is playing with an amplifier on a, a live um, music uh, performance uh, on stage and there's feedback between the microphones. Um, it's this business of resonance and if uh, um, with the, uh, the harmonic series that effectively is a feedback me mechanism and it feeds back on itself and it strengthens strongly harmonical linked ratios, especially octaves and those very, very strong um, harmonic ratios that we saw in a harmonic series. Um, so the, the resonance, the feedback me mechanism is what sort of feeds the forming of it in the first place. But there's another opposing force or, or factor ongoing. There's a, a damping factor at the same time that moderates this resonance and stops it um, effectively just getting uh, feedback on itself again and again until something blows up. 
Um, and if we didn't have this, effectively, our universe wouldn't exist. You know, it 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 would literally disintegrate. Uh, with, with you know, without these two mechanisms, one in the first place, the resonance uh, that starts building these standing waves, and it's the standing waves that are are, are the structure of our matter, um, or what we call matter. Matter doesn't really exist as such. It's it's just waves, and um, but they 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 have behaviour like like particles and 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 that in certain circumstances. But it's the damping that's really important. And what I discovered was there's, there's a connection of the damping the damping factor, and its connection is to the golden ratio phi or phi the golden ratio 1.618 or it's inverse 0.618 and i won't go into the golden ratio but it is extremely important and we know ourselves it's, it's held within the pentagram it's uh, related to the to the number five and to root phi and actually part of um the sri uh, I, I suppose it was part of the jewel. So it's a very important number. Um, here's another representation. This is phi here. So if you have two squares, again, this is very common in esoteric uh, literature where you end up with two squares like that together. And in this case, we've got a circle in, in the center and then taking the diagonal right across there, going from there to there, that is phi, which is the 1.618, never ending uh, in decimal terms, ratio. And that, the one over phi, is, it, it, is um, it, it, it's inverse. So beautiful, very elegant piece of geometry there. Um, I, I hadn't come across that one until this mm, last year, I think. Very, uh, very pleased to have come across that. So coming back to resonance and damping, dampening is, uh, you know, what helps form them, but what helps the standing waves uh, uh, remain stable is, are oh, we getting, uh, there's some really good stuff here. There's this gentleman called Richard Merrick. He's written a book and he's made it freely available online uh, with PDF and his whole website. Um, and his book is called The Grand Scientific Musical Theory. And I'll be going to a few pages in his book. It's a, I mean, it's a big book, very sophisticated piece of work, um, very impressive. But just um, I'm going to be talking, uh, referring to music scales, standing waves, the ratio of phi, and really interesting is 007. Um, I'm going to look at page 80 for some symmetry aspects within the musical scales. Um, I've got to remember these numbers. 138 for the business about the phi and how it, how it plays its part in dampening those resonant waves and keeping them stable. And then some really fun facts on page 137. So I need to look at page 80, 137, and 138. Ah, I made the links well. Not sure if you can see this, but I'll um, blow it up a little bit farther. But what he did, his analysis, and uh, a very impressive piece of work, this, he, he, he found a symmetry within the music scales, um, which absolutely baffled me for years. Now, I'm not a musician. Um, I've been teaching myself music theory for the last two years, but it doesn't come naturally to me. Um, but this gentleman, uh, if you're a musician, you, this will... Um, uh, immediately you'll, you'll understand this. But the important bits is that he found a symmetry 
uh, within the music scales to do with it, uh, what they call the tritone. And from a sonic point of view, we're looking at a diatonic scale. So he found a symmetry with, 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 within um, uh, the, the music scales. Excuse me whilst I flip back to and fro here. Going on to another page. And so we're on the pages 137 and one and subsequently 138. I think this will be really interesting to you um, because we're, we're talking about Roslyn Chapel. And he discovered that in, in the geometry within Roslyn Chapel was the ancient knowledge of harmonic, harmonic resonance and damping and for a long time held, held most secret for, I, I guess, uh, um, you know, a very, very, very long time. So within Roslyn Chapel, uh, he's, he's found this geometric information um, concerning uh, how to control resonance and the damping. And he, he, he goes on about uh, some Masonic things and things, but the, the key thing is Roslyn Chapel of great interest. Um, now, he, he, he found within the... Um, music scales th that there's a damping factor ratio uh, between these two notes and he's actually very kindly given them the frequencies of these notes so when we talk about minus six and that if, if you know music that's fine but for somebody like myself I, I, I relate to a more I guess from a scientific uh, perspective so he's given the frequencies there and the ratios, and he's identified there's a position between here, which is a damping factor, um, which is related to phi, and there's also a resonance um, factor, which is effectively at one and two thirds. Now, if I can ask you to remember the one and two thirds uh, business, um, because it just crops up all the, all the time. And what, what, what he's figured out is that there are differences between these ratios, um, which all come down um, where, where there's a there's basically a, a, a space of silence. It's to do with the damping. It, it's silence, uh, where, you know, within the musical scale, to do with phi, and uh, and you know, between these gaps here, there's a very small um, uh, difference of 0 0.007 between phi and the ratio 13.8. And then that goes on, um, uh, just saying that this this is esoteric knowledge of harmonic principles, like this was not uncommon among alchemists and natural philosophers in the fifteenth century. And well, it then goes on a little bit about John D and the 007 and the, a bit of the story that he used the 007. Um, to Queen Elizabeth to represent his promise of silence. Um, as apparently he was a spy. Um, and then of course that goes on to James Bond and Ian Fleming and so on and so forth. Now this continues, this, this story continues a little bit. And if you are a musician or you want to get into the numbers, please, please, please do so. This book is wonderful work. Um, now, there is one more thing I want to talk about, 
it's the the Roslin magic ratio, which is a particular number, 0 0.012345667, miss out the 8 and 9, and that is equal to the ratio 1 to 81, and then that's 1 to 3 to the power of 4, um, which is quite, really quite really quite magical um and and again this this was totally new to me um and i i i think it's quite uh, amazing so within roslyn chapel there are encoded within the geometry these really important ratios and of course 81 it's worth pointing out is nine times nine nine squared and nine is three times three so hence three to the fourth. So, um, and, and, and we'll see as we go along, three sixes and nines are really critical uh, to this subject and, and to, mu to music as, as well. And then finally on this subject, some more ratios. Uh, we've spoken about this ratio times 81 is actually equal to one, which is quite amazing. And there's an inverse to it, i.e. one minus this Rosalind magic ratio, and that is 0 0.9876543 miss out the one and zero. And then the, from a harmonic perspective, why this is important is if you take this magic ratio, one over whatever, it's always equal to a whole number or two over, it's always equal to a whole number and they are harmonics. And I thought that might be of interest to SRI and Masons alike. Right, I've just covered that. Here's another fascinating harmonic ratio, which I've, I guess I found this myself, really. Um, if you take the square root of 10 in base 10, i.e. decibel numbers, and that's 3.162, whatever, goes on forever. And then you take its inverse, i.e. 1 over that, um, the 1 over the square root of 10, you get this number here, which is a harmonic a precise whole number harmonic ratio of 10. Now, that is beautiful symmetry, absolutely beautiful symmetry. Now, interestingly enough, you can get this, um, these harmonic ratios being displayed in other numbers for example, like five, but the interesting thing is you have to work it out in base five. Otherwise, if you work it out in base 10 for five, it, it, it doesn't exist. Um, now, I've done a few numbers and this is an ongoing piece of project. I don't know if it's all numbers. Well, I know it's not all numbers. I just need to know which ones it works for and which one it does. Um, and here I'd like to give a credit to my college secretary, Frater Michael Smith, for encouraging me a little while back to check this aspect more deeply, which is the checking out the, does this harmonic symmetry, harmonic ratios exist in other numbers, in other bases? And it does, which is quite remarkable. A uh, little bit more about harmonics. This is actually my own work, which I started about five years ago or so, when I decided I thought that the, uh, wh wh why do we have 360 degrees in a circle, 60 uh, minutes in a good degree and 60 seconds in a minute, because I thought that it, my intuition told me it had held something interesting. And after a little while, I figured out that it really does. Um, and it's effectively to do with, um, if you take, uh, for, for example, um, 
something like 10 degrees point zero one six nine or whatever you take the the fraction after the decimal point and then you scale it up by 60 and then you take its digital root which is uh, i've shown how the digital roots here work gave some examples here but it's effectively the same as dividing by nine and you get a remainder um the answer is always a three or a six or a nine, always. And it's to do with 60, which is six times 10. Six is uh, a perfect, the first perfect number, which is one times two times three, or one plus two plus three, definition of perfect number. And it's the first one, and it's six by 10. The six I understood, the 10 took me quite a few years to figure that one out. Um, but you get these harmonics when you scale up decimal numbers, or rather the, the bits after the decimal places, um, or indeed any, any unit. It um, doesn't have to be a degree. It could be, uh, oh, um, it could be a foot, could be whatever, any, anything that you scale up by 60 and then you divide it by nine, you're always going to get these one of three answers. And that's really quite profound and has a lot of implications. Um, this is the same thing, but um, we're, it, we're, I'm just showing it that we're, di we're dividing by nine and looking at the remainders. And in this case, we always get a multiple of nine, a multiple of nine, multiple of nine, could be zero nines, but it's a, always a multiple of nine plus a remainder. And that will either be, um, well, uh, either zero, one third or two thirds, which uh, effectively is the counterpart to the previous screen. And it, it, it is really quite significant and what I've done here is just a simple circular diag diagram. We've got a, an equal actual triangle in here, which wonderfully, absolutely wonderfully sit on uh, when we divide circle into, uh, into nine parts. Um, the top is nine and there's the three and the six. And there is in fact a relationship here going on with the triangle. Uh, this pictorially shows it. And I think this is very elegant when you consider the, um, the logo for SRI London. And there's a relationship to here with the, the musics, the octaves and the fifths, which are to do with the thirds and the two thirds within music. So there's a physical relationship here going on with numbers, and it, it really accounts for why 60 was used, presumably from the Sumerian days, why they used base 60. Um, it, it, it really does reveal something quite profound and quite significant, and it's harmonics, really. That, that's what it is. So the, the numbers themselves, now, there's a, a wonderful um, video here about frequency and form and platonic solids and, uh, and uh, pl 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 platonic shapes, uh, the um, circle, square, triangle, pentagons, hexagons, and so on and so forth. I'm mindful this is quite a lot to take in at one go. Um, and I'll work towards a close. And then if somebody wants to come back to any particular video, we can do so. Just a little bit, just to show that the same exists in light. There's a gentleman, oh, two gentlemen really, um, uh, Clay Taylor and another gentleman who invented a device that uses light to show sound. And I'll show you some of his um, 
So I think he's using a laser on bubbles and things like that. But within all these sounds, it shows all the musical ratios and the key ratios. These are all ma ma musical ratios in a, that, that we've been speaking about so far. which is quite, quite remarkable, really. And this is nature. This is what nature does naturally. So it's not something we've invented or artificially created. We're now getting to the, the, the level of technology where we can do this. And I, I, I have just shown, and of course the credit belongs to uh, these people here. This is not mine. Or, um, I want to give them to a crazy show. Um, and here, within this particular sound, um, it's demonstrating the phi ratios. Now, phi is within the geometry of the pentagram, um, which we are now familiar with if we weren't before. And here we go, ratio of 1 to 1.618. And this is what nature does. It's quite, it's, it's quite, it's quite amazing. Um, that we covered in the earlier, the, the relationship where the elements are atomic elements and cells have um, um, harmonic structures based on geometry, as we've been speaking of it. This is fact, and, and uh, there's documentation and reports in the past. We've, I, I played this video earlier, I can skip that. Now, with regards to perception, I, I thought perhaps we could discuss this a little bit, but if I could stick a stake in the ground and say what my take on it is at the moment, bearing in mind we can't know the unknowable, we, we, we're just never going to do it. We're, but humans, are we build models, it's the way that we um, build some understanding and it takes a step further or farther rather. But from my perspective, um, motion and time are simply an illusion. The universe is just one big crystal. It's static in that sense. Um, and there are an infinite uh, number of possible realities within our crystals. Um, because if we just go back to Euclidean, geometry and um, the requirements are Euclid and you have two points uh, on a line, you can always find a point between the two points where you subdivide it and you can just do that forever and ever. And likewise, you can extend the line. So the, there's always space between the points. Um, so in that sense, if you have a have what the analogy we would be one big crystal, and the crystal is a, a crystal of an infinite number of points and geometries in there, um, that essentially means that we can have an infinite number of realities. And my take on it over the years is that nothing actually moves, it's an, an illusion. Um, and it's actually our consciousness um, that is driving us through this um, um, all, all these possible realities that can occur. But it's, uh, it's actually, it's our consciousness is, and the movement is because we're simply time traveling. We're moving through it. We can't perceive um the whole universe at one go and that because our consciousness is not that fast at the end of the day and in in in, in as our consciousness directs us either deliberately or um uh, or consciously or unconsciously 
which most of us are on autopilot most of the day, um, what, what actually happens is that it's our, our consciousness creates its path by resonant, attun a resonant attunement to the geometry and we are using our attention and our, our will. So my take on it is that consciousness chooses its reality. And um, uh, I'll, I'll skip that. So perhaps we could discuss that if anybody wants to, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll move towards closing a little bit now. There's a gentleman um, that I've corresponded with um, for a while now. Um, wonderful man, uh, retired recently, a uh, professor Robert Harrelick, and very pro prolific academic, well respected, and he's turning his research skills now that he's retired. He's actually investing his time and his skills and his energy into researching um, effectively consciousness and subtle energies. Uh, I'll bring that down a bit. Um, and I wanted to pass this on to show that this is what's now happening in some of the academics. Um, I call them more enlightened academics, um, but they, they are now actively researching these things more and more so today. Now there is, uh, I think I'm just gonna have to click that. There are two parts to this video that I want to play. So first, I got to explain the, the this Pythagorean is, tune. This is the circle of fifths yeah. for people who have done anything in music typically know. As you move to the right, you're moving up by what's called a fifth in music, but which in harmonically means it's one and a half times the frequency of the of the um, of the fundamental. I'll just stop there. That, that, that is the ratio three over two. Um, this is where the thirds, the two thirds um, are, are, are coming in and he's talking about um, the relationship within uh, music language, fifths and fourths and so on and so forth. But we're actually going back to the threes and sixes and nines and those harmonics we found within the um, decimal numbers themselves. And as you go to the right, it's one and a half times, one and a half times all the way down. And the Pythagorean actually went a little more than halfway around. And then for the other thing, they went around the other way going by a fourth. And if you go down by a fourth, you're going down two thirds. So this just shows, for example, uh, tuning going up the circle of fifths. So they're shown here from hertz, through kilohertz, through megahertz, through gigahertz, through terahertz. These were nurturing frequencies, life supporting frequencies. So the conclusion, the frequencies involve these ratios of two to three and three to two and their powers. And you can go all the way to the very high octaves and it shows a close relationship between the frequencies of the surveyed water spectra Pure water absorption spectra show precisely the same frequency pattern as found for the living cells and the biomolecules with the investigated range of actually UV to gigahertz. Uh, here's an illustration. Of I, can, I can stop up there. The important bit there is his own research. And we, we, we have shared um, things in the past, but the, this man is a giant in the academic world. Um, he's found with his study the relationships of these thirds and two thirds and music, the beneficial effects on, on water. Um, so in, in a sense, he's corroborating the previous informa information I've shown so far. But what I think will interest you very, very much if I, if I 
just uh, um, about five minutes. Uh, good morning. Today we're going to talk about subtle energy and water. And it's going to be a talk that summarizes uh, a lot of the things that now are in the literature, particularly re rela relating to quantum mechanics effects. The way I got interested in this was I began to see that all these things that prana, chi, od, organ, torsion force, life force, subtle energy, was being talked about in a community of, actually it's a wide variance of the communities, and these are not in the textbooks. If you go to the classic textbooks or the modern textbooks, they're not there. And there is something in science that says, when you meet something that is not accounted for by the current paradigm, that that is actually most interesting. And various different things going from peer, uh, prayer, dowsing, healing, remote healing, remote viewing, ESP, water properties included, magnetic effects in non-paramagnetic materials, gravity, nuclear decay rates, biogeometry, telepathy, there are more than these. But just to give you a sample, and, and some of these are actually very well known, and some of these are, are very well practiced. For example, dowsing has been practiced for a long, long time. <coughs> All right, subtle energy. Uh, in a given setting, energy is the capability to produce a force that does work, causing a change. And subtle energy cannot be, by the current paradigm, considered as an energy force. For example, telepathy does not generate enough energy to go from California to New York. Uh, same thing with healing. And there's no known mechanism, for example... Uh, stop there um, on that uh, particular video. go back to the presentation but that's really to to show that there, there are very serious academics um, more and more now working in this particular field and it's certainly something that interests us of course i'll end for a quick close here i won't play this but if you're familiar with the theremin musical instrument you don't is played by somebody, they don't actually touch it. Um, they're interacting via electromagnetic waves with uh, receivers and they can play it. So I'll leave that for you to watch at your leisure. This is a very good podcast by Dr. Joseph Farrell. Some of you may or may not have come across him. This was recorded six years ago. Brilliant, he's the absolutely brilliant sort of man. You you might enjoy some of his work. Getting towards the end now. Uh, my college is Hammond with Strange College, number forty-two. We have a website. Uh, you can find us there if, if if you want to. And I'll bring this to. Um, live presentation to an end now but just point you to some resources and then if somebody wants me to go back and play one of the videos that i didn't play because they are all excellent is this link here is just a little website that i use to help shape this particular presentation i have far too much in here for one presentation but there are wonderful, wonderful links that will um, be of interest to you. And what I'd like to just point out is I've got some personal favorites uh, in, in books. 
um, by an author one masonry and its symbols by Harold Waldwin Percival lovely book I think if you've not come across it I think you'll enjoy it um, another lovely one I found uh, again you can um, you can you know read these they're they're old PDFs online so the, uh, I'm not aware of any copyright issues um, it's it, it's a, a lovely book uh, on, on masonry and be, be, be of interest if you've not come across it with regards to the topic of perception there's this lovely book the spell of the century as sensuous by David Abraham and I, I enjoyed this book here and I particularly um, ah, and this gentleman the bard I spoke to to do with Shakespeare um, lovely video and I also particularly like this book here um, so anyway, that's an online resource if, if it interests you. Uh, a second one is, is I'll show you. I have an account with a um, website called raindrop.io. This is just the link if you haven't got an account and you can get a free account, no problem uh, with that. And if you have a free account you'll see or be able to if, if it interests you over the last six months I've put together some 3,600 papers and links and that uh, which with because I do a lot of duplicates for various reasons but there's a um, there's about 2,000 very high quality links in there something for everybody and, and, and you can do a search on it. Uh, for example, um, generally Karl Monk, uh, Karl Monk interests, uh, very interesting. Um, Stan Tenin, who found the relationship of the Hebrew letters and the, in particular the fire letter Yod, of which all the other letters are formed and um, that's just fascinating stuff. And it is actually all connected, all of this. Um, if, if such a thing's there or you've got, you know, you want to while away an hour or two and you could just search through these or find something. And unfortunately, a few months ago, I just couldn't keep up with actually classifying them. So there's a lot of unclassified ones, but you can see here, um, all sorts of things um, to do with geometry, harmonics, and just about everything all connected together. And at that point, if I may, I'll end the live presentation. Thank you so much for your patience. I know it's been, I'm not sure how long it's been, but you've been very patient. Um, so I'll stop my share and if I can hand back um, to our host. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Peter. Um, your enthusiasm for the subject is wonderful. Thank you very much uh, on behalf of the Metropolitan, uh, Metropolitan Study Group. Um, as you said right at the beginning, this subject uh, is, it's like a rabbit hole, isn't it, really? You know, you go down one bit and then it leads into another. And before you know it, you're, you're in a, a, a maze. Um, so um, just for future reference, um, this, this is important. When, when people present uh, anything at these meetings, ideally we need them to present things from their own perspective, their own studies. Um, if people make reference to other people's work, then that's fine if they maybe uh, include those as part of the, uh, uh, the written presentation, but playing somebody else's video on YouTube may probably, it's likely to cause us copyright issues so um, uh, when we come to uh, potentially upload your talk, 
um, this might cause some problems because you have been playing as part of your talk somebody else's copyrighted material. So I'm just pointing out this may be an issue. Um, yes, I understand. Yeah, so please please bear in mind that we might have some problems with uh, um, uploading your talk to the YouTube channel. Having said that, I'd like to proceed with the, uh, the questions. I have a hand raised um, by the people at the Atlantis Bookstore in London. If anyone has any questions or comments or observations they'd like to share uh, or, or questions for Peter, please, in the little uh, reactions tab at the bottom of the screen, if you could raise your hand, that makes things a lot easier for me uh, to moderate. So over to you, Alexis in London. I thank you. Thank you very much for the paper. Uh, my question is more um, arises out of curiosity from, from this immense amount of effort that you put into analysing this. From I don't know whether you've engaged in any self analysis. What, what have you learned by by reviewing this and applying this to your experience of, of your own consciousness of of reality or of your own experience? I mean, what, what have you learned about yourself and the way your consciousness functions? What have you drawn from that? Well, what I have learned was I've, uh, um, I've actually revised my review somewhat of the nature of the reality itself in in terms of a physical model whereas pr previously i would have thought well there's there's one universe um and it's a harmonic one um but now with a better understanding of geometry and mathematics i've now opened up to the fact that um the possibilities are, 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 are quite infinite um, and therefore what what I have learned from this is the level of choice that I have. Um, perhaps often when you're getting beaten about by life itself you sometimes feel that you don't actually have any choice in things, uh, any control, but now I've learn myself that I do have more choice um, to exercise that choice I need to be more disciplined uh, in, in, in my choices um, and the way I live um, so that that's one thing I've learned um, is I've actually got more options than I thought I had. With regards to consciousness, um, I've, for most of my life, I've, I've sort of lived, lived in two worlds. One, one is our everyday world, go to school, go to work, family, and so on and so forth. Um, but at the same time, uh, there's always been a connection with something outside of myself, beyond myself. Um, I was aware of the connection. I was aware of that it was a very helpful connection if I needed any help with a particularly difficult problem, um, for example, in work. A uh, very difficult analysis problem or finding a solution um, to, to something. I learned over time that I could just ask and then I could trust that the information would come to me, uh, even to the extent if I said I need an answer by tomorrow lunchtime. Um, so I, I, I've been very fortunate that I um have been aware of this exactly what's going on i don't know um i have heard it 
in hermetic terms, some people speak of higher genius, or some people in spiritual terms say, well, you've got spiritual people helping you, and so on and so forth. Um, but what this work has, has done, has it, it has taught me so much. I've probably been working on this subject for over 20 years, and in particular, I started the analysis on the 360-degree circle about five years ago, or five, maybe six years ago, when I, shortly after I joined SRIA, uh, I thought, well, I need to give a lecture of some kind, and that was just one big ball of string. Uh, but I have learned so much, and just putting this together, um, uh, I, I have been rewarded. Uh, I do hope that we don't hit any copyright rules. I, I did my best to only show publicly available information. Um, some of the links that you'll find in the resources are password protected, and they're, they're clearly not. Um, um, for example, the book Quadrivium, that's a book that's on sale, it's not a copyright and thing. So I was mindful of those things, but uh, this is, in order to describe or, or explain a, a, a very broad subject in a way that makes sense in our physical models, um, I had to draw on those that had walked before. And because of the years I spent with this subject, I know the very high quality resources. Um, so if nothing else, perhaps you, um, you, you know, so, so, some of those it, 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 uh, people that make those videos, their YouTube ch channels and so on and so forth, might might be you you might be new visitors to, to them um and and you might enjoy their work um very high quality work but i do appreciate the the the, the, the possible constraints on the copyright we'll have to see what happens thank you very much peter um uh, gentlemen i'm not sure how to pronounce this uh, versus uh, you've been very patient, so over to you, sir. How do you pronounce your name? Ursus. Oh, I thought Ursus Bear. Uh, greetings from Lancashire 9 up in the north. Yep. Uh, thoroughly enjoyable, thank you very much. Um, uh, particularly enjoyed that. Uh, I'm a professional musician by trade, so if you ever want to touch base and talk about harmonics, resonance, etc., uh, more than happy to thank you. Uh, help <laughs> yes. you with that. Yes. Uh, from a musician's <laughs> perspective, uh, you can get in touch through the college. Um, you spoke about the Merrick book, which I've not come across before, uh, in particular his work with Roslyn. Um, is anywhere in that book, does he draw reference to the work by Stuart Mitchell, uh, a Freemason back in the 60s, uh, with his work on the Roslyn Motet and the uh, harmonic song that was found within the architecture of the chapel? I, I don't know. I'm still working my way through the book. Um, the, the way I tend to work is I somehow or another get drawn to the bits that I need to be drawn to. Um, from my perspective, he, he had identified this resonance and damping and also the symmetry within the music scale. Um, and to me, um, I come from a physics perspective. Um, he, he had answered um, some very, very important questions. And as I work through it, um, I've also got a memory like a sieve, unfortunately. So I, I, I can read a few chapters and then I have to go back again and start reading them again. But when, when I do read, if, I, if something, something really important will stand out to me. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question directly. No, no, that, that's fine. I, I would just point out a, a read of that book as well, just because it, it's a very different take on um, the, the chapel, uh, but does uh, bring into uh, play the physics uh, and harmonic frequencies uh, and the shapes that sounds make uh, as to why the 
little patterns are the, the way that they are. They actually make a musical uh, song with the, the angels showing the instruments and so on. Well, that's, that's his belief. Um, but, but worth a look. Yeah. For, for, for musicians, he, he, he makes a good argument, whether it's true or not, that the uh, we're, we're talking about tritone here, and you'll know more what that is than I do, but I, I know broadly what it is. Um, and that the church suppressed the, the the use of the tritone, whether whether he's right or not, I, I, I do not know, but he, he seemed to have done a lot of research and his argument was quite strong. Um, my, my, my daughter's a choral singer and composer, and I asked her, I said, um, is that true? And she said, well, not now, you know. We, <laughs> yes. but it, you, you know, it, it might well have been. Uh, well, it's one of the reasons why we have C major at the start of our sense now, rather than A, which was the old minor where everything was based around the, the old melodic uh, structure. Uh, the Osophus moved us to C major, uh, and while we have this peculiarity that C is the centre of the piano and the sort of centre of the, the modern world, but originally it was A um, with that moving frequency. Um, I, well, I, I think you'll enjoy the book if you, if you have the time to, to dive into it. Um, the, the nuggets about Rosalind Ch Chapel, I thought, well, I, I, I can't not tell you about that. And I, I was particularly stunned by those ratios and then when um you know one over the ratio magic ratio two over mm -hmm. they all come out as whole whole numbers just as i was when uh, it came to my realization that the um square root of 10 um and uh, it, it, and and it's inverse um have a whole rate uh, number i mean they're supposedly irrational numbers which is a whole nother game which i thought we'd better not get into that um because uh, mathematics is a little bit um a, a bit like physics really there you know the, the, there are gaps and things that are not quite right um but there are some wonderful math mathematicians coming up like uh, norman wildberger professional mathematician he, he's written a book which, again, is freely available. It's in the links somewhere um, called Divine Pro Proportions. And if you're a maths type person and he's talking about stuff which is really old Masonic type of knowledge where we're dealing with squares and squares are squares. So we're not dealing with square roots and that. But we're actually just squaring everything up. And he's developed a, a new form of rational mathematics a base around what is really ancient knowledge and knowledge of nines and, and, and things like that. So so all, all, all is not doom and gloom in the academic world. So, um, but to answer your question, I, 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 I don't know the answer to the, the original question. No, that's fine. And thank you for your, uh, thank you again for the presentation. Thoroughly enjoyed it. You're very welcome. Um, thank, thank you, you Versus. Uh, could I ask you, um, what's your instrument? What's your chosen instrument? Uh, funnily enough, I started life as a theatre organist, but uh, piano, but I conduct and arrange for orchestra, so uh, I can tell you about a lot of the harmonics with uh, most of the music, musical instruments. Fantastic. Um, um, uh, uh, are either of you um, or any of the other people here aware of the comma of Pythagoras? Oh, no. Um, Peter? Oh yes, and that's actually um, uh, in 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 that particular book by um, that we we're just talking about uh, uh, around about the pages. It actually um, accounts for the, the, these um, commas and things. Um, unfortunately, I am not a musician, and even though I've been working at it for two years, mm. um, I can talk physics type language but once people start talking in the music language um I, I i'm still not fluent or confident enough as yet but i've I, i've certainly heard of it um one video that we which i didn't play which was the frequency and form which is really worth watching you know find go on the youtube channel and and just watch it um 
and that basically connects the frequency 432 hertz versus 400 retuned modern 440 hertz A, um, but relates it to 432 and at all to the platonic um, uh, the, the, the shapes and um, three-dimensional um, platonic solids and it ends up with what is a perfectly harmonic factor nine grid and and it, it's, I mean I wish I could but you know <laughs> I could go on all day I think with with that type of stuff um, that's really worth um, watching I I, I I believe I think you'll find it interesting and it does tie together 432 hertz the connection with geometric shapes and interestingly our time base of one second um, uh, I had one musician when I said well there is a connection between geometry and our physical reality and he said it doesn't matter you know we can just scale up and things like and said no no it's it's much more fundamental there than that and it, it's uh, is connected to our basic unit second you know 60 seconds in a minute and mm -hmm. 4,000, no, 432,000 seconds in the morning and likewise in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, that's a wonderful video. And, and it kind of gets away with a lot of problems that seem to have sort of crept in, I suppose, over the time, um, for whatever reason. Um, I mean, that's my take on it when I read uh, things about, like, Pythagorean commas and they're trying to sort of you know, try to fit some gaps and that's where I particularly found um, the gentleman with it, with his book um, uh, musical theory um, just just marvelous and he, he seemed to account for things beautifully in my in uh, from my take yeah thank you um, the the thing why I mentioned um, the comma of Pythagoras is because it deals with the bits that don't fit. We, we seek order in the study of things like mathematics and geometry. And um, we gravitate toward order. We want to find order and some, and some sense of meaning in, in things. And in many cases, we do. And there are deep uh, mysteries contained within those um, orderly uh, geometric ratios and harmonics as you you were describing earlier but the thing personally that interests me are the gray areas they're the they're the things that we do not we we are not capable of uh squaring off it's the beautiful imperfection in creation that's the thing that i find most interesting because in, in all scientific disciplines, we like to think that we are, we are trying to understand things in very particular terms. Um, but it's always been the case that what we think we know is superseded by uh, deeper insight as we progress in, in the study of the mysteries of, of creation. And it will ever be this way, in my opinion. Um, we'll never get it which is why I mentioned the, uh, the Tao that can be named is not yeah. the true Tao at the beginning. But I really recommend there's a book by a gentleman called um, uh, Ernst Joachim Berens called Nada Brahma, The World is Sound. Nada Brahma, The World is Sound. Okay. okay. I'll, 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 it's a very, very interesting book and I highly recommend it. I think you would probably uh, find I, it very interesting. Nada, Nada Brahma, the world is sound. Well, hopefully this video will make it um, um, on YouTube. Um, Fingers crossed. Y yes, uh, as I said, well, they're, they're publicly available, so you know. Um, yeah, that's part of the that's part of the issue, though, uh, Peter, is that it is somebody else's copyright material. Yeah, well, I, I'm not claiming it is my own, am I? No, no, I know you're not. I know you're not. But yeah, um, unauthorized um, uh, use of 
someone what is someone else's intellectual property that's the issue that's the issue. right okay well it's not it's no fault of yours it was it was done in all innocence and with great enthusiasm but they have their rules that's that's the way that things are um i have uh, stephen you've had your hand up for a while thank you for your patience over to you well, I, I'm debating a fantastic presentation, Peter, um, and very in, interactive in terms of the way you used a variety of, of images to explain a fascinating topic. And I'm going to ask two sort of interrelate, well, two questions, because I couldn't decide which one to ask. So you'll get both of them. One is, I suppose, when we talk of alchemical transmutation, a, a magical cere ceremony that seeks to affect change. Would you say that essentially, from your perspective, the, the alchemist, the magician, is essentially assembling together light, sound, um, colour, that are varieties of waveforms that affect physical change, and that in your explanation of the universe, that's what essentially is happening, that a transmutation or a magical change is a, 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 a willed effect through the assembly of various harmonic um, energies. And the second unrelated question is, if Nicholas Tesla was joining us, what do you think he would say? Uh, with regards to the first question, I, I believe in magic and I believe in magic uh, by the power of mind. Um, but I think you need to understand the, um, the rules of the game. Um, and that, that's not an easy thing because it you know, takes a long time and we're forever learning. Um, but I do think if you can master these understandings, you can use the... Um, the, the the concepts of harmonics and resonance um, to, um, for example, to attract something. I mean, if you if you want some gold, the best thing to do is hold some physical gold. Uh, for, for example, um, I think um, change can be affected, for example, in, in, in rituals, uh, in initiations, and that the whole environment and the energy and uh, intention put behind those conducting the ceremonies can make a huge difference on an initiate's or a candidate's um, end result. Um, I was very lucky 30 odd years ago. I had a marvelous initiation into masonry, absolutely marvelous. I understood it as um, a spiritual science first. At the time, I was actively working in spiritual healing, hands on healing. Um, and um, I, I, I recognize that side of it. And I also appreciated so much the effort that went into giving me um, um, an experience that made a huge difference to me personally, a transformation. You know, I, I was transformed um, by that and steadily over the years have kept on climbing the ladder. Um, I, I, I don't distinguish between unseen things and physical things um, so much, or perhaps like a lot of people might do. And that's probably because of my background in, in, in healing. Um, and also with a bit of a science background, I understand the nature of vibration and harmonics 
and things like element transmutation, which happens in water cavitation, plasma fusion, um, you know, they, the, the, these processes, the elements aren't there, they have these processes and then all of a sudden you've got gold and you've got carbon and you've got this and, 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 and things like that. Um, I don't know if that answers the question particularly well. Um, I, 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 I don't split things in two. I tend to see things as a whole from my perspective. Um, now, with regards to Nikola Tesla, he, he, he was famously, he's famously quoted as saying, if you understand frequency and vibration and, uh, and three, six, or three, six and nine, yeah, you'll have the secrets of the universe, and 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 that was possibly not him. It might have been a predecessor, um, Keeley, but either way, Nikola Tesla understood longitudinal waves, transverse and longitudinal waves. Um, he understood numbers, three sixes and nines, and harmonics clearly. Um, If he were here today, I don't know. I would have loved to have met the man. <laughs> I, 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 well, he was just so far ahead of his time, so far ahead of his time. And his, his work was um, stolen and hidden and suppressed and still is today, um, and, and unfortunately. Um, but I, I, I hope that we, as we move through a a raising of consciousness on the planet in, in general, it's going in the right direction that once again, we can return to um, paradigms uh, which are not based on false scarcity, which is what it's been like all my life. People tell you this is scarce, that's scarce, money scarce, water scarce, energy scarce, and, it, and, and it's not like that in practice. Um, and, and we'll move back to one where, where we will start bringing back ancient knowledges and sciences for the benefit of everybody on the planet. And, and we'll see the so-called free energy um, things, uh, you know, uh, so we're, we're not all slaves to the, you know, the power companies and so on and so forth. Um, uh, he, I mean, Tesla was saying, well, what's taking you so long? Uh, and of course, the answer to that is, well, big ball string, isn't it? So, but I think we're moving in the right di di direction. And it's, I mean, this isn't the subject that I just bumped in and I thought, oh, I've got, oh, I've stuck my hand up to do a presentation and just whipped up, oh, that looks like a good video. Just, you know, these are very, very considered things to get over complex ideas at least a broader audience anyway um and I, i've kind of sort of lived it for 20 odd years um but physical material transmutation magic um or what we would call magic um i guess one of the you know most famous adepts would be um, Christ Jesus, <laughs> he 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 understood this as as have other, um, um, you know, great 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 people before before him, and I dare say that quietly on the planet there are some very skilled uh, alchemists and what we might call magicians, but I think they just understand natural law very well, and. Um, and part of those natural laws are related to, you know, to, well, to harmony and resonance, and and we, you have to work with the laws. Um, and I, I think there is an element of um, you, not only do you have to understand them, but but um, you have to respect them. And if the purpose for what you use this type of knowledge and 
I suppose, power or gifts or whatever that some people um, manage to um, reach. Um, you, you know, there's, there, it's got to be consistent. I, I, I don't think that the, that the universe is just purely mechanical and, you, you know, just like machine, like clockwork. Um, there's something much, much deeper um, you know, above, behind, wh wh whatever, but behind it all. And if we learn to understand the way it was designed to work and then we align ourselves with that, not only will we personally be better off, but I think everybody else will be better off as well, those that surround us. And it's hard work. It's, um, it's not, you can't just, well, I found you just can't read a book and say, oh, yeah, I understand that. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an adept or, or, or whatever. Um, it, it's, it's hard earned. Um, even this presentation preparing for it has taught me so much. Um, and it's a cliche, but I know less now, or I now know that I definitely know less than I thought I knew six months ago. And, <laughs> and I already knew that I was going backwards, you know, that every bit that I learned, um, you, you know, a big vista opened up and, um, uh, and, and, and it just got, more amazing um and uh but yeah i've learned a lot i've benefited a lot i hope even if the video doesn't get on to youtube that the audience have at least enjoyed uh, something and that there's something for people that's perhaps new or interesting and um I wish I knew more music theory. I, I, I wish I do, but I think it'll be a few more years before I get proficient in it. Thanks very much, Peter. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Peter. Um, the people at the Atlantis Bookstore, you've had your hand up for some time. So uh, if there's anyone there who would like to ask a question or contribute, then now's the time. It looks like they may have uh, popped outside for a little while. If that's the case, then we'll carry on. Um, is there anybody else who would like to ask something of Peter before we wrap up today's meeting? Anybody feel free to step forward. If we don't, then now might be an appropriate time to bring our meeting today to a close. So. Uh, once again, Peter, thank you very much indeed for your presentation today. There was an awful lot of work and, and passion has gone into that. And the, uh, the collection of materials that you showed the links to, um, if you can, I know you sent me an email earlier. I don't know whether it contained those links, but it, it, it does. It does. About half, yeah, about halfway through the slides. I, thank I you go through all um I, I i i a lot of slides i just didn't yeah. have to use thank you that's great so what we'll do is um if we uh I th it'll probably be the case that we do upload the video to youtube but there may be some copyright issues with that so i'll need to to uh, discuss that with the uh the um the other people from the metropolitan study group committee and uh, we'll see how we need to proceed with that. But if it does go on YouTube, then we'll add those links and that information there for people as well. Um, so, yes, Stephen, you had your hand up again. Please. No, that, that, well, I was trying to do the icon for clapping, but the hand came up. So that was a mistake. <laughs> so I apologize for that. But no, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a proper round. Before. Likewise, likewise. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Peter. Um, take good care. Have a wonderful weekend. And thank you once again for your presentation today. Um, we, we hold these meetings on the third Thursday of every month, uh, with the exception of August. So before our break, our next meeting will be on the third Saturday in July and it will be a presentation on the English Kabbalah. So I hope you can join us for that meeting. Oh, I'd, I'd like to 
uh, be part of uh, to listen to that. I'd like Lovely. To. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody who's joined us today. Take good care. Have a great weekend. And you. Bye-bye. We look forward to seeing you.